Welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. Today we have on Judith Herman. She's a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. She was the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies and is a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. And her new book, available now, is called Truth and Repair, How Trauma Survivors Envision Justice. Welcome, Judith, and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And so before we begin, I really quickly want to say that it's such an honor to have you on the show. So I first encountered your work in graduate school by Professor Dr. Glenn Albright, who is a trauma professor in our Baruch's mental health counseling program. And so I read Trauma Recovery it was blown away by it. It was by far my favorite book in the graduate program. So when we saw that we had the opportunity to potentially get you on as a guest, it was just phenomenal for me. So thank you again so much for coming on. My pleasure. Okay, so in her book, Judith wrote, Perpetrators who have not been caught do not generally volunteer to be research subjects, so we know almost nothing about them. Finding out more about the perpetrators in our midst has not exactly been a public health research priority. So at present, we don't have answers even to the most basic questions of epidemiolo epidemiology. We don't know what the percentage of men in the general population what percentage of men in the general population commit rape, or how these men differ from those who do not. In the rare confidential studies that have been conducted with perpetrators at large in the community, the researchers have been left scratching their heads for an explanation. By and large, these perpetrators do not report childhood abuse, nor do they meet criteria for any psychiatric diagnoses. Mm. Like others who commit crimes sanctioned by tyrannical regimes, they look frighteningly normal. So that to me, by far, out of the many great quotes and the chapters and just sections of this book, that for me was probably the most shocking thing, because oftentimes when we think of people who commit any type of sexual assault or any sort of egregious action, we think narcissistic personality, uh, antisocial personality, we essentially think of people that we see in the movies like Dexter and, you know, these type of shows and films where you see it, where you can think of the psychopath. And I know early on in your work, it, going into the studies with uh, father-daughter incest, the thinking was that it was such a minuscule uh, population or such a minuscule amount of people that sort of that commit these acts that it wasn't necessarily even worth really thinking about. So, Judith, I mean, there's so much to cover here, but can we actually now start with the beginnings of your work? And can we go back to about the late 60s, early 70s? and start thinking about, okay, so how is it that you began to start thinking about who's actually committing these crimes? How is it that you started be, started to begin thinking, okay, wow, it's actually a higher percentage of the population. And then also, what was it like when you discovered, wow, these people are not necessarily all narcissistic? Hmm. Um, well, yes, I, um, it, it, I, I sort of stumbled upon this really because of... Um, six months before I began my psychiatric residency in 1970, I joined a uh, women's liberation consciousness raising group. And um, I mean, my group was a bunch of uh, white, privileged, highly educated, mostly Radcliffe grads. Um, but even in that demographic, uh, there was all this talk about sexual assault, sexual harassment, domestic violence, and so on. Um, and this was the era where the speak outs were beginning on, on rape. Uh, the first uh, speak out on rape was organized by New York Radical Feminists in, I think, 1970 or 71. Um, and so all of a sudden, the, the degree of violence against women was coming into public awareness. Uh, and as it happened, my first two patients on the inpatient service where I began my residency were women who had made suicide attempts. Uh, and both of them gave histories of father-daughter incest. Now, at that time, the comprehensive textbook of psychiatry, which was the go-to textbook, mm -hmm. estimated the prevalence of all forms of incest at one case per million. So what do you suppose the odds were that I, as a 
complete newbie would have two cases as my first two patients. Right. Something was not computing, right? Something. Um, well, I think it was because I had the women's movement that I was able to listen to these patients with a different kind of awareness. And what do you know? They got better. Mm -hmm. You no, know, when somebody uh, actually validated them instead of you know dismissing them and and was compassionate instead of scornful and um, and guess what? Their fathers were you not not obvious raging maniacs, right? Uh, they, you know, in fact, as I and my colleagues began to gather more and more cases, what we kept hearing was nobody would have believed this because everybody respected him. Everybody looked up to him. He was a pillar of the community, you know, and in fact, uh, these days when I hear pillar of the community, I think, uh-huh. You can't reason backwards that way, but I start to think, mm -hmm, I wonder about this guy. And in fact, um, the, um, when you're talking about crimes of violence committed by a dominant group against a subordinate group, um, these are abuses of power that are carried out by all kinds of quote unquote normal people. I, um, I mean, one of the big inquiries after the Nazi Holocaust was about, um, you know, what was the matter with these people who committed atrocities and mass murder? And um, in Hannah Arendt's, um, immortal phrase, this was the banality of evil, the psych same thing, the psychiatrists were left scratching their heads because these guys didn't fit any kind of uh, profile of, of a personality disorder or uh, sociopathy or substance abuse, certainly not major mental illness. Um, they were people who took advantage of the fact that they had power and they had impunity. And in fact, for crimes of violence against women or any other subordinated group, impunity, uh, you know, they may, the, the crimes may be felonies in theory, but in practice, nobody's ever prosecuted. So, um, you know, the crimes are invisible and they're rationalized and excused and enabled by a whole bunch of people who cover them up. Would you say that um, due to the power disparity between the perpetrator and the victim, that there's some sort of a, a sort of a dehumanization that takes place? Or would, would you not call it exactly that? I, I, that's a good word. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, once you... Uh, feel entitled to use other people for your purposes and to coerce them if they don't cooperate and do what you want, then, um, I mean, that opens the door, basically. Right. And I think now it's important to talk about now how some of what is it, what are the kind of eliciting factors? Because if we're not now describing it in terms of sociopathy or any psychiatric, especially personality disorder, but psychiatric illness. So what has your research found in terms of what these kind of uh, sort of propellants or what these causal factors are? How do we create, I mean, not that we want to obviously, but how do we kind of create all of the, the sort of the bedrock or the, the kind of cultivating factors in order to create what was called a rape culture? Well, actually, uh, there's been some good research on rape on college campuses. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the very striking findings there 
is the, influ the enormous influence of the peer group. Um, I mean, the good news is as far as we know, most young men do not commit rape. Um, maybe, we don't really know the prevalence, but maybe between five and 10%. Right. Um, and that's the same that uh, my colleagues and I found, for example, with psychiatrists who abuse their patients. Um, that was about 7%, I think. Uh, uh, but, um, or I think, anyway, anyway yes. Um, but, um, Young men who were either members of fraternities or sports teams were much, much, you know, more likely, I mean, twice, I three, I don't know the exact figures, but mm -hmm. way more than just statistically significant, you know, um, remarkably more likely. Wow. Um, commit sexual assaults. And indeed, if you know, you have a frat culture where uh, gang rape is a tradition and just like hazing um, and where at my own university, Harvard, for example, it was found that uh, what my colleague Diane Rosenfeld calls target rape was very common at uh, we our equivalent of fraternities, which are called final clubs where, you know, uh, vulnerable women, freshmen, who, you know, would be so excited to be invited to this, you know, very exclusive party uh, who don't have their uh, friendship groups yet and don't have anybody to watch their backs who are inexperienced with alcohol, um, are invited to the parties, the punch is spiked, and rooms are set aside uh, for um, uh, sexual assaults, basically. Uh, and then they brag, you know, they get bragging rights afterwards and they s celebrate. So, um, so if you have a peer group that is enabling and um, and, and, and basically uh, enforcing a kind of a bro culture or, a, you know, a, a, a macho culture, you're much likely, much more likely to go, like, go along with the crowd and uh, uh, get involved in this kind of activity. That's insane, right? It, combining that power disparity with the fact that there's a peer group that normalizes this kind of behavior, right. combining that even with the fact that even for many women to even speak out and, you know, socially make public what had happened to them, all of these integrate and probably some other factors I have a blind spot to at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, combine to just create a really vicious sort of a, a problem that's hard to you know sort of escape from right. or or mend right rather. and then also what i really love about the book is that now you're going into the criminal justice system and the idea is that essentially the person isn't necessarily a defendant it's the idea is that the state is pretty much the defendant and you're kind of just there you're kind of there providing maybe testimony uh some evidence but essentially it's the state that's kind of defending itself and i love that when you point to the victims and how they interact with the state how they interact with the police force i mean there are various elements here but essentially the victim isn't really given much of a platform for it for their testimony it's not really taken as seriously so can we talk a little bit about that about what it's like when victims actually do report and how oftentimes essentially they're not only dehumanized obviously by the rapist but then they're also marginalized and sort of isolated or made to be or made to feel invisible by the actual system supported supporting or purporting to support them mm -hmm. right well in our in, the, in our criminal justice system um the state is considered the injured party uh, not and, and the the victim of a crime is only a witness. So it, um, that's true in the in criminal justice and civil court. And uh, 
the victim can be a plaintiff, the, the victim can bring a complaint. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and then the the accused uh, at, uh, is required to uh, respond and the, the state is neutral. Um, but um, uh, I think the, the re one of the reasons that the idea of criminal justice is that the state is the complaining uh, party rather than the victim is uh, partly a kind of progressive idea that an injury to one is an injury to all. Right. Um, but also this very this very deeply ingrained idea that victims are going to just be so vengeful that you can't let them bring a complaint because they'll just want revenge. Right. Um, and this is such a stereotype, and it absolutely was not worn out uh, by uh, the interviews that I did with crime victims. Um, but it means that, for example, the victim uh, does not decide, has no decision-making power over uh, whether a complaint will be investigated properly, whether charges will be brought. Um, and if charges are brought in criminal court, the, t the scales are balanced in favor of the defendant uh, in two ways. One is um, that there is a presumption of innocence for the right. defendant. And the other is that the, the uh, crime must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and those very stringent protections for the defendant are based on the fact that the state generally has so much more power than any one defendant, any, any citizen. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take into account the fact that the defendant probably has a lot more power than the victim. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no balancing protections for victims in criminal justice. And even in civil court, it's an adversarial system um, I, I, I like to tell this anecdote about, I, I took a course at the American Psychiatric Association back in the day um, on how to be an expert witness, hmm. uh, because there were some of our patients who did want to seek justice. And if we were in a position to, you know, testify as experts, we want I want to know how to do that. Uh, Phil Resnick, who was, was a very eminent um, forensic psychiatrist, uh, started the day with a big, putting up a big slide of these mountain men with rifles across their knees. And uh, these were the Hatfields and the McCoys. Mm -hmm. And he said, you may think we have courts to, you know, ascertain the truth or to mete out justice. But really the reason we have courts is to resolve disputes without firearms. Mm -hmm. um, and short of that, he said, any kind of nasty, hostile attack um, is legit, is okay uh, in court, in an adversarial system. So. For victims to come forward, they have to expect um, that they are going to be slut shamed and um, they are they are going to be treated as though they're the offenders. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I, I like to say if you actually wanted to design a laboratory for exacerbating the symptoms of PTSD, 
a court of law would probably be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so it's no surprise that for rape, for example, maybe 20% of victims actually file a police report. Um, and then from there on, you get this attrition curve that's like an exponential decay curve, mm -hmm. uh, looking at you know the, the number of cases that are accepted, uh, that result in arrest, that are accepted for prosecution, that are actually go to trial, you know, go to right. trial or result in a guilty plea, um, that result in a conviction and then a, a prison sentence. And so you've got, by that time, you're, you're down somewhere in, in the zero to 5% range. So basically for offenders, it means your odds of getting held accountable in any legal sense are, you know, uh, pretty good, you know. Mm. Uh, I mean, 90, uh, your, your odds of getting away with it are 95 plus percent. It's insane too, because, you know, from a sort of a psychosocial perspective, especially, you know, when the, the victim is actually in the right, that they, they really were a victim of rape and uh, let's say, you know, they're uh, being questioned or rather they're being, they could be potentially gaslighted, right? Yeah. Or, right. And that, uh, like you said, can really sort of, unless I suppose they're very mentally strong, I suppose, but otherwise they can really exacerbate your mental emotional state. And it just doesn't feel like the right sort of a, a setup um, for this kind of a proceeding, even though, uh, you know, there are arguments against what I'm saying too, but I do like that in, in your book that you mentioned the, that there's sort of hope, you know, in, in civil suits at least, right. As, a, as opposed to, you know, um, uh, state versus uh, the, um, right, right. And, yeah. and, and what I love so much is that you essentially add now going back to that sense of invisibility is that if you were to ask the victim, Hey, what do you want for this person? Nine times out of 10, it's not prison. So the interesting thing is here you have, yeah, right here. You have these criminal cases, which for the most part, victims aren't even necessary. So, I mean, yes, there is a sense of or a need for justice. And of course, I mean, that's always going to be the case, but that's not the type of justice that they're looking for. So I love that your book focuses on these kind of misunderstandings that we have of what victims are looking for. And this idea of the scornful woman or let's say the scornful victim or whatever that these kind of myths are finally put to bed so oftentimes what you have is that you have women who are saying you know fundamentally I, I don't even want to really necessarily talk to or see this person again I don't really care too much about what happens to him I more so care about what happens to me and what you see in the criminal justice system is oftentimes the spotlight is fo focused on the defendant where the idea is either okay you know this person is found uh, guilty and we you know throw the book at him and send him to prison or he or he or you can make this could be a she uh, they're found innocent and essentially they're done. we're done with them. You know, we kind of wipe their hands. We wipe our hands of them. So I love Judith. Can we start now talking about what is it that the victims are actually looking for? And what is it that we as a moral community are actually responsible for in that respect? Well, let me just back up one, one sec before talking about that question, because the other myth besides the vengefulness of victims is the myth of false complaints. Mm -hmm. This enormous uh, angst about false complaints. And in fact, uh, there is such a thing as a false complaint of sexual assault. Seems to be for, uh, according to the studies we've got, it's about similar to um, false complaints of auto theft. Mm -hmm. You know, again, zero to 5%. Um, uh, I mean, most victims who come forward, they, you know, it, it, uh, it's not, uh, I mean, it's an ordeal for them. Right. And so they don't want to subject themselves to it unless they have very strong motivation. And the motivation, as you say, is not uh, they want to see this guy punished. The people I interviewed, I interviewed 30 survivors of various forms of uh, 
sexual and domestic violence and trafficking and harassment. Um, 26 women and four men. Um, mm -hmm. And they were not big on punishment. They were also not big on forgiveness. They felt that, that was, it was just too easy to pressure the victim to forgive and forget. You know, it's over. Why make a fuss now? You know, right. rather than actually do the hard work of holding the perpetrator accountable. Um, but what they wanted from, they wanted their communities uh, uh, to back them up, basically to acknowledge, first of all, that they, every one of them wanted acknowledgement. They wanted the community to say, we understand this ha happened, not only just recognizing the facts, but recognizing the harm, saying, because often that's the, the fallback position of the defendant is, um, okay, yeah, so it happened. So why are you still whining? Wow. You yeah. know, uh, big deal, you know. Uh, uh, acknowledging the facts, acknowledging the harm, and, 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 and saying this was wrong, denouncing the crime. They wanted the shame removed from their shoulders and put on the shoulders of the, of the perpetrator where it belonged. Right. And that was 100% consensus. Uh, uh, and, and so they were much more interested in healing the relationship between themselves and their communities and the bystanders than they were uh, with what happened to the perpetrator. They, they wanted the bystanders to step up and right. say, you know, stop looking the other way, stop rationalizing, excusing, but, you know, um, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, like the judge in the notorious case in California where um, uh, a frat boy was found guilty of raping a woman at a party mm -hmm. and the judge gave him a slap on the wrist because he was a fine young man and he didn't want to ruin right. this fine young man's life. Right. Um, uh, so they wanted the community to stop excusing and enabling the perpetrators and actually to denounce the crime. And, and in that way, healing, you know, healing that relationship. Uh, and then in terms of uh, what happened to the perpetrator, um, Quite a few of the people I interviewed had filed complaints, uh, more than the statistical, you know, average. Mm -hmm. um, and six actually went through a whole criminal trial to a conviction and a prison term for the defendant. And the reason they did so was they, they uh, some of them were very, even then, very ambivalent about prisons and punishment. Right. But they said, you know, they'd seen these guys up close and they were, they, uh, they figured he's going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know any other way to protect future, you know, potential future victims. Um, one woman said, I, I, I just couldn't live with myself if, you know, <clears throat> I found out he did this to someone else because I didn't have the guts to step up, you know, and to, to testify. And 
And there were more who would have been willing if, um, if the prosecution had been willing to go forward, but it's the prosecution's call. Uh, and a lot of times, unless it's a stranger rape and preferably, you know, a young blonde white woman raped by a black stranger, then the prosecutors will go all out. Right. But most rapes are not stranger rapes and they're not interracial rapes. And um, most are acquaintance, you know, acquaintances. And so then it's going to be, you know, well, how much were you drinking and what were you wearing? And, you know, why were you walking on that? You know, why were you, you know, in that car? I mean, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so. Um, uh, so, for example, one of the uh, one of my informants who was raped by a boy at a party uh, said, "You know, the family was a very prominent family in a wealthy suburb, and she went to the police, and the detective said there had been." several other complaints, but nobody had the nerve to go forward. Um, and sure enough, when she actually did file a complaint, the boy's father called up her father and said, you know, basically, how much money do you want? Can't we mm, make this yeah. go away? You know, um, so it's you know, these things don't happen unless there's a community that facilitates and, uh, you know, looks the other way. Right. And you stress so much the importance of the community, which I love so much. And I also would add that it's much easier to heal the repar the, the, the what would you call them? The uh, sort of the damage between you and the community as opposed to the damage between the victim and the perpetrator. And so in this really important passage, I want to really read it. Uh, I want to read it really quick before we continue. So in this passage, Judas, uh, Judas Rowe, Reverend Anne, Anne Marie Hunter, whom we also met in chapter five, uh, expressed similar skepticism about rehabilitation of batterers, given how society enables their behavior. She knew first hand how commonly the justice system failed to enforce court orders for protection or child support and how commonly the clergy counseled women to submit to abuse in order to fulfill their marriage vows and keep the family together. She thought that because batterers live by the rules of tyranny, the only motivation for them to change, and this is such a key part, to change might be a forceful mandate from a high, higher male authority. Regarding her ex-husband, she was sure that no amount of reproach from women would matter at all to him. The only thing that might make a difference, she imagined, was would be, quote, if his father who treated his mother the same way had a change of heart and came to him and told him he should do the same, or if his boss told him that what he did was unacceptable, or if a religious leader forcefully denounced him to his face or from the pulpit, mm -hmm. and unquote. So, right, the idea here is that essentially we really do need to start to change the culture because now when we are, I mean, I hesitate to use the term toxic masculinity, but uh, even though we're going to get some backlash for it, but it is what it is. So I'm going to use that term. And so what you often get is that you often get men who are essentially in some ways somewhat childlike and they think of these authority figures as gods and so ultimately in order to change their behavior we need to we need to have older men who, pr who pretty much teach them better and who tell them listen i've made this terrible mistake you know alan and i were talking about this before uh we started filming so there's a new documentary on arnold schwarzenegger and look with arnold schwarzenegger with all of his faults at the very least in the documentary he apologizes profusely and he says look if i can go back in time and i could redo all of the things that i did if I could redo the denial, if I could redo all of the shame and embarrassment I put through these poor, poor people, poor women through, I would give it all back. He's like, it was 100% wrong. I don't even have any words for it anymore. So that's what his children and more importantly, the people who still idolize him, that's what they need to hear. And so we need more men taking responsibility. And again, it really is up to now the moral community to kind of piece this and work, piece it together and make it work for all of us. I agree. And I, I think we have some very interesting models of how to go about that. Um, uh, I think of college campuses as a very good laboratory for developing sort of culture change and, and new educational models, partly because of the educational mission and partly because the demographic, you know, the 18 to 24 year old demographic is at the highest risk for sexual assault. 
both. Uh, so uh, there's a, and I also think that education for young men uh, uh, can emphasize the ways in which it's also in their interest to change the culture. There's a, when you use the phrase toxic masculinity, it reminded me, there's a very nice model that's uh, been developed at Northwestern University by a psychologist named Saeed Derek Hill. Uh, it's called the MARS program, and I think it stands for masculinity, allyship, something and something. Mm -hmm. um, and he trains peer educators. And he has this exercise called, he, he uses the term restrictive masculinity mm -hmm. instead of toxic masculinity because it's a lot less pejorative. And it also kind of invites the young men to think about the ways that that a macho culture, you know, a male supremacist culture, it hurts them. Right. Um, so he he has this exercise called the man box, where he asks young men to talk about the the. the the, how they would describe a, ma a manly man. Mm -hmm. um, and he writes the words on the board and it's always things like, drinks lots of beer, eats red meat, has sex with lots of women, mm -hmm. tough, stoical, uh, you know. And uh, he says the word loving is never spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he draws a box around the words and then he says, and what happens if you venture outside this box? What do you get called? And they, you know, pussy, yeah. faggot, you yeah. know, bitch, um, pansy, you know. Um, so then he says, we're boxed in here, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And so the guys start to think about you know, and, and then they go out to places like fraternities and sports teams and so on and do, you know, and people will listen to peer educators in a way that they might not listen to faculty, you know. Right. Uh, right. You know. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I, by the way, I want to really quickly give credit to Alan. So Alan, out of our entire friend group, is incredibly open about his needs. And I kid you, I'm, I know this is going to, he, he always gets so uncomfortable when I praise him. So like I'm I, fine with it. okay, so I'm <laughs> often still kind of like that boxed in person because of kind of the culture and how I grew up. It was very, it was a very, it was an honor culture. So all of us, because we're Russian, we grew up in an honor culture. But if you ask Alan, and if you ask him in terms of how his relationships are going, what he's looking for, he'll straight up tell you, he'll say, no, I'm really looking for love. He's like, listen, that stuff might work for you guys you might want to date around but no i really like this person she means a lot to me i love having these great conversations and the rest of us still kind of cringe you know because again we're from that culture and we're like oh that's not kind of what a boy is supposed to do but no it's really great he's actually able to kind of buck that trend and say no no that's not what i'm looking for i mean there's a there's a place for all of these things right There, there's a place to be stoical there's a place to be you know like rigid a little bit mm -hmm. but but yeah of course you have to integrate other Parts it's just hard. It just it's really hard. And sure. I think that's kind of where we're going in this conversation that when you're coming from that background, and especially when you have, you know, the elders looking down on you, you're like, ooh. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I would just say that uh I I personally I don't like the idea that uh for example, if if for example I felt uncomfortable mm -hmm. being anything outside the man box, mm -hmm. I would be bothered by my own discomfort mm -hmm. because I would just question, why am I uncomfortable? There's something going on there, mm -hmm. right? Like, why can't I act in these other ways? Right. Uh, I would just be reacting. And reacting is just, you know, not to get philosophical, but it's it's being like a, a no, essentially, to right. something as opposed to some sort of proactive force. Right, right. Yeah, but that's, but, yeah. But remember, we're all, we're social beings and we all are very... Uh, vulnerable to shaming and ostracism and being ridiculed and that's what happens if you 
don't conform. Yeah, right. Right. And then just kind of because I really, you know, for time's sake, want to get into the kind of nitty gritty stuff here. So in terms of now what victims actually want and what they are looking for. So now we have somewhat of an alternative. And what I really love about this is that in your book, you're not exactly married to the alternative. You put it forth as an option, citing the fact that these are only preliminary studies and we're only starting to look into what this actually looks like. Um, so can we now talk about how the moral community can actually get involved to heal the victim, what that would look like and feel like for that person? And essentially, you know, what are the responsibilities of the moral community here? Well, you know, the, the, I think the, the, there is a kind of an alternative judicial philosophy uh, that's developed in recent decades called, called restorative justice. Um, and in theory, that would be much more congruent with victims' needs because um, whereas the, the conventional justice system focuses on punishing people for breaking laws, the Restorative justice philosophy is about repairing the harm that was done rather than punishing the offender. And in fact, they, they don't use the language offender and victim. Uh, they call the, they talk about harm doers and the person who was harmed. Um, and rather than an adversarial system, the theory proposes a consensus-based system in which everybody has a voice. Um, the victim brings his or her supporters, the perpetrator brings his or her supporters, and the community uh, takes the role of judge and jury basically. And, and uh, there is no fact-finding mechanism in restorative justice. So it, you know, it, that's a, a serious limitation. But if the harm doer is willing to acknowledge what he's done, then people are brought together. The harmed person gets to basically give a victim impact statement and ask for what he or she wants. The perpetrator, the harm doer is expected to acknowledge, apologize and make amends and offer to make amends. Mm -hmm. And then the, the group decides what the amends should be. Um, uh this uh so it's you know proposes that rather than you know punishment and then uh incarceration and hardening offenders and you know kind of perpetuating Right. That's a key point. I just really want to yeah. highlight that really quickly, yeah. right? That the, the punishment and pri imprisonment tends to actually harden people as opposed to restore any sense of justice or as opposed to, you know, there's no remedy for it. Plus, just to tag that a bit, um, th through acknowledgement, whether by bystanders or the actual perpetrator, especially in the context of a sort of a moral community or those who are aware of the people involved, the victim and perpetrator, that actually helps to set free the victim in the sense that before their uh, reputation, I mean, it's not just about reputation, but that that ends up being uh, remedied, right? With all those people. Now they have a an understanding of, of what's going on. Also, when, when they see that the uh, perpetrator uh, actually acknowledges what they did, if they were somebody who was on the side of the perpetrator, whether it was, oh, that's a fine young man or that's my brother, that's my father, that's my grandfather, cousin, or whoever it is, that also sets things right within that um, community right. uh, aspect. Yeah. Yep. 
so it's a it's um it, it's a, a very interesting alternative model. It's been used, it's been developed most fully in places like Australia, New Zealand, uh, partly based on indigenous practices, partly based on sort of radical Christian pacifism. Um, but it seems to be most widely accepted where there's community consensus about both the seriousness of the crimes and the need for rehabilitation. So for juvenile property crimes, you know, uh, some or, or theft, mm -hmm. um, where nonviolent crimes, where the there's consensus that yeah this this is not good this needs to be taken seriously but maybe the kid needs a you know a chance to uh get you know get back on the right track right. rather than severe punishment so in those situations there's been it has a pretty good track record now um, when it's been applied to, I mean, there's much more controversy about applying it to crimes of violence where, and especially where a dominant group is, um, you know, accustomed to impunity mm -hmm. for violence against a subordinate group. Um, in South Africa, it was really made uh, restorative justice was made famous by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, Archbishop Tutu. And there it was really, you know, part of the negotiated settlement that ended apartheid, um, where the deal was amnesty in exchange for full confession. Right. Um, and it, it worked incredibly well in terms of centering the testimony of victims. I mean, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, headed by Archbishop Tutu, heard the testimony of many, many, many victims who, you know, whose sons and husbands and fathers had been murdered um, by, um, you know, the secret police, basically. And, um, uh, and the testimony was broadcast on, on radio throughout the country live so that it made it possible to really establish the truth, you know, the, at least the acknowledgement part was done. Mm -hmm. you, you don't, I don't think you see in South Africa the kind of glorification of apartheid that we have here with the glorification of the Confederacy. Right. Um, we don't have a gun. There isn't a gun with the wind right, right. Uh, in South Africa that says apartheid was, you know, good for these civil, uh, we civilized the savages and, you know, uh, we're so good to them. Uh, but uh but the reconciliation part did not work. And I think I have a colleague who, a psychologist named um, Pumla Gaboto Maticella, who was on the Truth uh, and Reconciliation Commission. And she said, it, the reconciliation didn't happen because the truth, was, the acknowledgement was just step one. And what mm -hmm. there wasn't, there was no apology and there was no amends and there was no accountability um, so that um, there were no reparations, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and that without, so that it was necessary but not sufficient for real restorative justice because you, you don't, you, you need the acknowledgement to start with, but then you need the apology and the amends and the 
the the reparations to repair you know to to repair the harm to the extent that it can be repaired in a lot of these cases, uh, the, the kind of reparations victims are seeking, at least in many of the case studies that I've, uh, or rather cases that I've seen in the book, is that they're looking for uh, maybe payment for the mental health uh, treatments that uh, maybe they received, right. you know, th things like that. It's not always this, you know, this, uh, that stereotypical assumption of, uh, you know, you want vengeance necessarily against a person. Uh, there was even a woman, uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, in one of the cases who um, she didn't ever want to see the uh, the perpetrator ever again. But uh, she did say when questioned, you know, if if he did apologize to me, um, it would at least be a start. I, I'm kind of paraphrasing yeah. a little bit, but even that would do something. Uh, and and that whatever uh, issue that she has with him, she doesn't want it to be uh, even something that's remedied between her and him. Rather, she's a very religious right. person. Uh, it would be between uh, him and God. And then she has her own problems to deal with. So it's like it's not always this, you know, you, you want uh, violence or vengeance towards the person. It, it could happen somewhere in the process right. that you feel like that. But. It's not always the case. You know, so add to that. Yeah. So, and I also love that there is a sort of a tier system to justice here where you make the distinction and now there's a, what would you call it? It's a scale where there's a scale of offense where it goes from serial rapists all the way at the one extreme to people who maybe conduct a sort of sexual impropriety because they don't really know much better. And I love that the justice system here is used in light of that scale. So what's so important to me, and this is the kind of criticism of the left is that oh, people pretty much say something like, oh, well, you know, you can't just label every man a rapist and yeah the thinking is of course nobody's really doing that and so i love that you're saying that okay in some cases the criminal justice system should get involved if we are talking about serial offenders yeah these circles as wonderful as they are they're not necessarily going to help them but if we are talking about people who are sexually immature we're talking about younger people we're talking about people who are trying to fit into their peer group uh let's say we're talking about people who just essentially maybe i don't know watch too many porno videos or learn too much bullshit from their older brothers these are people that can actually be helped the most of the time, it's better that this criminal justice system kind of stay away from that as much as it possibly could. But we're not saying that this is the ultimate resolution, because when we are talking about serial uh, perpetrators, these people are, again, now we're talking sociopathy and narcissistic personality disorder. There's very little remedies for them. And I love that you make that distinction. Yeah, oh, yeah. And... yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, for uh, basically repeat offenders who have a, a well-established MO, um, we don't know how to treat them. Right. We, we, I mean, we, whatever methods of rehabilitation we have, uh, they are not suitable. And there are some people who do need to be sequestered from society just because we don't know any other way of any of keeping the public safe. But that may not be the majority of offenders. And um, I think one, uh, uh, John Braithwaite, who's one of the theorists of restorative justice, is very critical of both the right and the left positions. You know, the right being the sort of supposedly law and order, punish them, except when it's us. Um, uh, and the left being totally involved, totally uh, identified with the defense bar, with the criminal defense bar, and thereby, as he says, just um, handing the crime issue to the right on a platter. Right. Um, but, um, but yes, you have a, a, a range of uh, different types of offenders and and uh, you know we we certainly need to learn a lot more about them and about what might work to help people change um but um but if you ask victims what they want um uh oftentimes what they want is for the offender to make amends, not just to them, but to the larger community. So one woman who um, 
uh, again, was raped at a party, uh, dropped out of school, uh, eventually uh, recovered and went on to become a criminal justice professor. And she's uh, co-authored a book about restorative justice. And she said, yes, she would want, if, if, uh, she, she really doesn't ever want to see the boy who raped her, but if he were to go through such a process, she said, besides uh, paying damages to her to pay for all the mental health treatment she needed, um, she said he would, she would like him to testify in one of her classes. Mm -hmm. To young, and, you know, talk about what he did and answer questions and, um, you know, be part of the culture change and contribute in that way, not just to heal her healing, but to societal healing. And a lot of people didn't even want money. Right from the perpetrators, they just felt that would be dirty money. Um, and, or, uh, you know, they would feel they'd been bought, bought off, but they wanted, like one rape victim said she wanted her rapist to give, she, the prosecution wouldn't go for it, it was a, it was a former boyfriend. Mm -hmm broke into her apartment no she she went to retrieve some artwork from his apartment he raped her the prosecution didn't want to go forward because it was you know they had uh he said it was consensual and you know it's gonna be he said she said and uh they so she sued him in civil court and won and what she wanted uh was for him to give $32 to the local rape crisis center. And when I asked her why $32, she said it represented, oh no, $30, 30, the 30 pieces of silver for which Judas betrayed Jesus. And I said, but he had a lot of money. He could have given them $30,000. And she said, I didn't think of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it tells you a lot about exactly what victims are looking for. Most of the time, the idea isn't that, that they're just a bunch of gold diggers looking for money. So yeah. now, now, as we're beginning to end off, I want to read one final passage from Judith's book. So Judith wrote, this is the radical survivor's vision, vision of justice. It challenges all of us to begin dismantling our most deeply embedded structures of oppression and to create new structures where everyone is respected, everyone is included, and everyone has a voice. When a person has been the victim of violence, survivor's justice challenges us to make reparations for the harm and to provide what is needed for healing. Survivors need truth and repair, acknowledgement, vindication, apology, and amends from their moral communities. When the community comes through with these reparations, the damaged relationship between the community and the survivor is healed. Trust is restored and a better kind of justice is done. The root causes of violence are the rules of tyranny. Prevention requires us to learn and practice the rules of mutuality, rules that form the basis of trust and justice in a democratic society. These are the rules that benefit everyone and we should all be fortunate enough to live by them. So I love that. And Judith, one final thing before we go. So your trauma recovery book was by far one of the most, not even, not even one, it was by far the most influential book I've read on trauma. And it was the foundation and the bedrock of my practice and of working with my patients, especially when it comes to trauma therapy. I am in awe by it. I am in awe of your career. And I thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Absolutely. And then, so Alan, final questions before we go. Ah, yes. So if we wanted to follow you, follow your work, and of course, buy the book, uh, where can we do that? Uh, I don't have any kind of social media. I'm mm -hmm. a very 20th century person in that regard. Um, but uh, the book, is, Truth and Repair, is published by Basic Books, which is yep. the division of Hachette. And you can just find it online pretty much anywhere or, or your local independent bookstore. I love it. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you again so much. This was, was a pleasure. Thank you so much. 
Take care. All right. Have a good night, dude. Bye. Thank you. All right. That was great. So uh, everyone, if you'd like to follow us, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram. On Twitter, we're Seize underscore podcast. Like, subscribe, hit, hit the, the bell, bell on YouTube. YouTube. And again, thank you so much for watching and see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.